Hello, I'm Gil Zilka. Welcome to my channel. Uh, this video is taken from my larger video discussing the major symphonies, which is a follow-up to my previous video on the major symphonies. Uh, this one is uh, covering the second grouping of symphonies. And if you enjoy this, I hope you'll take time to look at that larger video. Just know that you can click through it. It's divided into chapters to check out whichever symphony you're interested in. So I hope you enjoy it. Now let's talk about another giant uh, of symphonic writing, uh, 20th century Russian composer Dmitry Shostakovich. Um, and Shostakovich <coughs> um, really hit the gate running. <laughs> um, his first symphony was his sort of uh, graduation present from the, uh, the conservatory to the world. Um, it it, it uh, already featured his unique talents, his unique way of, of writing with uh, very you know, ex exciting explosions of sound, uh, as well as this sort of uh, you know, melancholy that he brought, uh, his, his own signature language, uh, and also the inventive way he orchestrated. Uh, and my top choice for this one is Eugene Ormandy in the Philadelphia Orchestra from 1959, a very good sounding stereo. Uh, and, and they just uh, play this in, in a, a, a it's, it's real exciting. It's uh, all, all the instrumentation comes across wonderfully. It's wonderfully recorded. Uh, that final movement is, is exciting. Uh, it's just a wonderful way to get to know Shostakovich uh, as he was presenting himself to the world and, uh, and becoming really uh, kind of a phenom uh, at a very young age. Uh, I'm going to skip the second and the third symphonies where he, he kind of was more... Uh, he wasn't quite as individual. He was more writing for the state. <laughs> Uh, and go to the fourth symphony. Um, this one is kind of like to Shostakovich as the Eroica is to Beethoven. Uh, it's it's where we get the full Shostakovich, and the Soviet authorities were none too happy about it. Uh, uh, it was it was uh, uh, labeled musical muddle uh, because it's it's very it's very bleak. I mean it's 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 what we got we became to know as as Shostakovich. Uh, very, very challenging, uh, uh, very moody. Uh, and uh, for this one, I recommend Kirill Kondrashin and the Moscow Philharmonic, uh, recorded in 1962. Uh, pretty good sounding stereo. Uh, Kondrashin and the Moscow Philharmonic, uh, always an excellent choice in Shostakovich. And uh, they really bring home that, 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 that bleak character uh the the haunting slow quiet ending for example is beautifully done uh it's it's very intense the emotions with Kondrashin uh, uh, performing Shostakovich is always very raw uh so if you're getting to know the fourth symphony uh, this is really a, a wonderful way to to hear the fourth uh now i discussed already in the first video the fifth the seventh, nicknamed the Leningrad, and the tenth. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead now to the eighth. Uh, this is really one of Shostakovich's masterpieces. It was written during World War II, and like the fourth, it's also bleak, uh, even more tragic sounding uh, and, and dramatic. And uh, this is a really famous recording of the work uh, from Yevgeny Merevinsky in the Leningrad Philharmonic, recorded in 1982. It's a live recording, uh, but uh, pretty, pretty good sounding. Uh, and uh, with Merevinsky and Leningrad, you get, of course, uh, j just the emotional heart on the sleeve. Uh, the slow movements are just poignantly done. Uh, very dramatic and intense in the fatter, faster sections. Uh, so uh, th this is a famous recording for good reason. However, one thing you should be aware of <laughs> is the, the symphony is recorded in C minor. Um, be careful because if you get this version of the same recording uh, on Philips, uh, you actually will be hearing it in C sharp minor. <laughs> it's, it's actually half a step sharp so if you're 
finicky about that. I mean, it sounds slightly happier <laughs> if you want to hear it that way. But if you're finicky about that, make sure you get uh, th this is the Regis uh, version. Or no, I'm sorry, it's uh, Alto is the. Are, are they the same? I think they might be the same. Okay. It's it's the it's Alto. Uh, so beware of that. Okay, next, uh, let's talk about the Ninth Symphony. And uh, this is one that was written at the end of World War II. And again, the Soviet authorities were kind of disappointed in Shostakovich because this was supposed to be a grand symphony uh, depicting the Soviet triumph. And it ten instead, it sounded comparatively light and trivial. Uh, it... it, it, it uh, it was actually for Shostakovich a little bit of a happier piece. Uh, uh, it harkened kind of back to his first symphony, I would say. Uh, and, you know, maybe for Shostakovich, uh, the end of the war wasn't something that he really wanted to commemorate, commemorate in that grand sort of way. So um, maybe for him, it, it was an appropriate thing to do, uh, even if it didn't make the authorities very happy. Uh, my recommendation for this one is Nime Yervi and the Scottish National Orchestra, uh, recorded in 1987. Uh, of course, they did a, a great job with that series of Shostakovich recordings. Uh, I recommend him for the, the Fifth Symphony uh, as well. Um, beautifully played, uh, just gorgeous sounds, uh, wonderful sound quality, uh, and, and just a very ap appropriate for Shostakovich, very exciting, uh, very well articulated, uh, so an excellent way to get to know the ninth. Uh, now, let's skip ahead to the 11th. And in this case, Shostakovich did make the authorities a little happier because this time he wrote a programmatic symphony about the uh, Russian, Rev Russian Revolution of 1905, the one that, that predated by a decade the, the, the Bolshevik uh, Revolution. Um, and so he, he depicted... Uh, you know the the, the the drama of the uh, the attempted coup, uh, and in in this case, I recommend Leopold Stokowski and the Houston Symphony, recorded in 1958. Wonderful sounding in this capital capital dimensional full dimensional sound series. Uh, just pop it on and listen to just those first couple of minutes, for example. Uh, the sound is amazing. The depth of that that slow desolate opening. Uh, and then the rest of it, it's very colorful and dramatic and enhanced by the, the sound quality that, uh, that just brings this vitality and, and clarity to it. So wonderful recording of the 11th symphony. Now we move to the final three symphonies. Uh, and with the 13th, uh, we get to something that's very different. Uh, for one thing, it uses voices. Uh, it's uh, called the Babi Yar Symphony. Uh, now, Babi Yar was the massacre uh, that took place during World War II uh, in a ravine called Babi Yar, uh, mostly of Jews. And uh, the symphony, I, I used to think when I first came across this work that that was a description of the entire symphony, but it's actually only the first movement. And even in that movement, it's more of a broader commentary on anti-Semitism. Uh, and the whole work, I would say, is it's really a commentary on state oppression in general, and uh, it's it's a very it's it's a very kind of defiant, uh, almost angry work. And uh, appropriately enough, the voices it uses are a bass soloist and a bass male choir. Uh, so you get that feeling of defiance uh, throughout. And my top choice for this one is uh, the premiere recording from Kirill Kondershin and the Moscow Philharmonic uh, with Vitaly Gromadsky as the bass soloist. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a pretty good sounding stereo recording, maybe just a little bit, little bit rough. But um, for a work like this, it, it almost, that's almost... Um, <laughs> that almost that's almost appropriate uh, because, it, it, because it is such a, a gruff challenging work uh, and you really get the emotions uh, just coming across palpably uh, in this interpretation uh, it's it's a really emotional work um, it's, it's really qu quite affecting uh, if you do want to hear it 
slightly better sound. Condorcet did a recording five years later with the uh, bass soloist Arthur Eisen. That's that's really good as well. Uh, but my, my top choice is is really this this first one. Uh, now let's discuss his next symphony, which is Symphony Number no. Fourteen. This is even kind of more off the grid. Uh, it's really more like a song cycle. Uh, it's for well, it essentially is a song cycle. It's for a soprano solo uh, and a bass soloist uh, with a, a string orchestra and percussion. Uh, it's it's kind of similar in that way to uh, Mahler's Des Knaben Wunderhorn, which is also with a soprano and a baritone in that case and an orchestra. And uh, these are this is a set of eleven songs that is uh, modeled uh, somewhat uh, uh, after Mussorgsky's Songs and Dances of Death. Uh, that, that is the theme throughout. Uh, and so, and, and actually that's one of the reasons why Shostakovich said he wanted this uh, to be a symphony, because he has that same theme running throughout. Uh, and for Shostakovich, death was something that he didn't. He didn't want to depict death uh, in this kind of otherworldly way. Uh, he, he's really more about the the starkness of death. Like death is just a thing that happens. Thwack. <laughs> and the final song. That's what you get. It's just very stark. Uh, you know, he 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 doesn't uh, uh, try to you know make it into this this beautiful thing in any way. Uh, but the work is really beautiful and ethereal at moments, especially the soprano soloist uh, has, has moments of, of, a th of a really uh, uh, haunting beauty, uh, particularly in this recording. Uh, this is conducted by Mstislav Rostropovich, the famous cellist. Uh, his wife, Galina Vishnevskaya, is the soprano, and Mark Reshetin is the bass. Uh, it's with members of the Moscow Philharmonic, uh, recorded in 1973. Uh, pretty good sounding uh, recording quality. Uh, and Vishnevskaya sounds gorgeous in those ethereal moments. And Reshetin has a real, this, this real strong presence. Uh, so it's, it's also really dramatic, uh, just re really iconic recording. Um, I do, however, also want to recommend uh, the earlier recording from the same duo from 1969. This was conducted by Rudolf Barshai and the Moscow Chamber Orchestra. Uh, this was actually a live recording. It's, it's, the sound quality is not quite as good. Uh, but, you know, normally I wouldn't recommend a second recording with the same exact soloists, uh, but it kind of complements the Rostropovich in that uh, there's a little bit more intensity and, and assertiveness to this interpretation. Uh, so it's 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 worthy as uh, as a compliment to to the sort of more uh, maybe ethereal patient uh, uh, Rostropovich. They're, they're both really wonderful. And then finally, we come to the fifteenth uh, Shostakovich's final work, uh, and this time he was not programmatic. Uh, in a way, it's almost like he went back to where he began with the first symphony uh you know what half century earlier uh but now we see a more obviously more mature shostakovich uh it's it, it starts out with a little bit of his humor like there's the william tell overture uh but there's also a grimness to the work uh and then the final movement he he uh quotes wagner's good to damerung and tristan und zola so it's got this kind of haunting quality uh, and then the final uh, the final uh, uh, coda kind of ends kind of indifferently. Uh, you don't know exactly what Shostakovich is, is saying. Kind of like what we're talking about with the way he looks at death. It just ends. <laughs> so it's kind of maybe an appropriate way for Shostakovich to say uh, farewell. Uh, my top choice for this one is uh, someone who knew the symphony well and, and championed it, uh, Kurt Zanderling. This is with the Berlin Symphony, re recorded in 1978. Uh, sounded really good, present and clear. And uh, he really brings across that kind of stark grimness. Uh, it's, it's got really wonderful character, th this uh, particular interpretation. Uh, 
uh, uh, kind of harrowing uh, sounding in, in that final movement, for example. Uh, so a, a really wonderful way to get to know the, the work. Um, I also want to recommend a very famous recording from Bernard Heitink, who did a complete cycle. Uh, this is with the London Philharmonic, also recorded in 1978. And here, uh, you you really get the, the the beauty of the work. Of course, Heitink tended to be a conductor who was, uh, you know, the, the considered non-interventionist kind of let the music speak, uh, and and that definitely uh, you know it has its value. Uh, so here the, the 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 climaxes are wonderfully done. The London Philharmonic plays lights out. The sound quality is incredible. Uh, so if if you love the work, you're you're also going to want to hear this. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, uh, I hope you'll also take time to click the like and subscribe buttons. And with that, I want to wish you all a great day and happy listening.